Uh, the two countries that I call home made important political decisions this year. One of them was Great Britain, who had its general election. And a lot of issues were buzzing about in the media. What should be the correct immigration policy? What does the future hold for the EU? And what is the proper way to eat a bacon sandwich? According to the media, the last one was the most important issue, so well done, Britain, for getting your priorities straight. Similarly, Latvia had an election recently. We elected our president. And again, a lot of questions asked about what is going on with the politics. Should the office of the president be politically independent? What should the foreign policy be? But every policy of every politician, whether president or prime minister, whether Latvia or the UK, every policy of every politician all over the world is based on one small and simple question. What are people like? You want your policies and your decisions to have impact. You want them to work. If you choose to privatize healthcare, you want to know whether that will exagger uh, exaggerate the existing inequalities or lead to a better service. If you lower the taxes, you want to know whether more people will start paying tax or you will just get a lower income. Similarly, this same question applies not only in political decision-making. When I was a teacher, I wanted to know how can I help my students achieve more. Now, in the magical world of academia, I want to know how can I make my ideas as influential as possible. All of these problems can be traced back to this one major question. What are people like? Answering this question is quite tough, as you might imagine. I mean, it's not a matter of 18 minutes, it's more for a couple of lifetimes of rigorous research. And even then, I would be bound to get things wrong. And then some other people will come here and make smug and pretentious TED Talks about where this guy went wrong. Instead, I will be the smug and pretentious person looking at other, other answers to this question. And for me, there is no better place to start than with Thomas Hobbes of Malmesbury. He lived in 17th century Britain, and for him, the essence of humanity, what people were like if we removed all civilization, was a very nasty picture. For him, this state of nature, this life without authority, was opportunistic and violent. He famously called this life as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This is exemplified very well in the frontispiece of his, one of his major works, De Kive. As you can see on the right, under the power of the imperium of authority, people are laboring, people are improving their lives. Whereas on the right, under freedom, under liberty, people are too busy to do anything because of all the murder that's going on. You might say, okay, this is quite a pessimistic view on human nature, and you'd be right in saying this, but Hobbes had every reason to be pessimistic. He lived through violent times, the English Civil War. For him, the return to our human nature, to our human essence, was closely linked with the execution of Charles I. For him, human nature was war, famine, and plague. So we can see that Hobbes' view of human nature as war of every man against every man was influenced by his times massively. But soon after, in 19th century France, we find a different view that's proposed by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau's view on human nature was as radically opposed to Hobbes as possible. Uh, his illustrations were different. We see the, uh, the savage, as Rousseau called him, abandoning the gifts of civilization just to return to the state of bliss, to the free human existence that he imagined being the state of nature. There's no competition and no war. Everyone is an individual that roams this land of plenty alone. 
It's a life of plenty and of solitude. Rousseau's writing was also influenced by his life. He was famously paranoid of becoming dependent on others, so as to scream at his friends when they brought him a gift. He enjoyed long walks alone, where he could be, and I cite, alone on earth, no longer having any brother, neighbor, friend, or society than himself. So we can see that both Hobbes and Rousseau, both of their writings were influenced by the times they lived in and by their personalities. And both are filled with notions of 17th and 18th century. Hobbes, for instance, had a chapter on demonology when he was writing about human nature. So if these ideas are so flawed, are they abandoned? Are they heavily reevaluated? Unfortunately, not always. Hobbes's and Rousseau's ideas of human nature lives on. In fact, we could trace a clear line of a history of ideas between Thomas Hobbes's writing and the War of Terror of the early 2000s. But fortunately for us, there are better avenues of inquiry when it comes to humanity, when it comes to human nature. A lot can be learned about our ancestors, the ancestors of our species, by looking at the actions of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. Similarly, incredible insights can be gained from archaeological evidence, the bones and the tools of our ancestors. However, the one thing that me and other members of the Hunter-Gatherer Resilience Project at UCL are most interested in is what we can learn about human nature, about ourselves, from modern-day hunter-gatherers. What are hunter-gatherers? It's quite simple. It's people who do not get their sustenance from agriculture or from uh, raising animals. These are people who get all the resources they, uh, they need from hunting, from fishing, and from g gathering plants. I, I could see in, in your faces there's some skepticism. OK, these are people who gather and fish. I personally have never hunted. Fishing for me is not a way to get food on the table, but a, mean, mean of a means of relaxing. And if I said if I was gathering, I think that, was, that would be stretching the metaphor a bit too far. But there's a lot we can get from hunter-gatherers as they are today. However, there are limitations. We are not the same as our ancestors, and the hunter-gatherers that live today are not the same as the hunter-gatherers that were uh, there in, at the beginning of our species. Most of you today will have different bodies than people 20,000 years ago. Most of you today have the amazing capability of digesting milk well into your adulthood, something that just wasn't there 20,000 years ago. Similarly, hunter-gatherers 20,000 uh, years ago did not live in these small uh, secluded areas where they have been pushed by farming populations nowadays. And of course, 20,000 years ago, nobody was wearing T-shirts. But when are we as a species, we as Homo sapiens evolved, we evolved as hunter-gatherers. That means all the things that make us unique and special, all the things that we excel in, like our cognitive capacity, our dexterity and tool use, our incredibly intricate social systems, all of these evolved for a hunter-gatherer world. So if we can't say that hunter-gatherers are equal to the people uh, of today, we can definitely say there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot to be learned. So, when asking the question, what are people like? We can ask the smaller and more simple question, what are hunter-gatherers like? Looking at a subset of humanity. So without further ado, let's meet them. Let's meet the hunter-gatherers. One group that we in the project have worked closely together with are the Agata from the Philippines. The other group, we'll focus on today, 
are the Mbenjele Bayaka pygmies from the Congo. Although both groups live far away, Congo is quite a, quite a distance from Philippines, both share a lot of similarities. And these commonalities are shared not only amongst the Agata and the Mbenjele Bayaka, but also amongst most of the hunter-gatherers, from the Inuit in Alaska uh, to Arche and Hivi in South America. And one of the first things you must know about, about hunter-gatherers is they move, they migrate, and they move a lot. If you do not grow food, you must follow it. And this has consequences. Your architecture will range from the simple to the very simple. Houses are built, abandoned, moved, rebuilt, adjusted. Houses even move throughout the day. This house keeps rotating throughout the day just to shield the family from the sun. Similarly, as you might imagine, material culture, your belongings are kept to a minimum. There is no room for poverty or for wealth amongst hunter-gatherers. Behind me, you can see the possessions of a household of six. I flew to Riga to, uh, a week ago with a suitcase that had more stuff than that. But for hunter-gatherers, all of these extra changes of clothes that uh, I packed in my suitcase are just not necessary. If you can't carry your belongings to the next place you move to, you have no need for it. There's only necessity amongst hunter-gatherers. There are tools, and most, most of their belongings are uh, crucial to their survival and their sustenance. The tools, the clothes, the minimum amount of jewelry, all of this is portable. And of course, there's food. There's food, there's hunting, there's fishing, there's gathering uh, honey and plants. But hunter-gatherers do not follow the tired stereotype of man the hunter or man the provider. Not at all. Although men tend to fish more and hunt more, every person in a hunter-gatherer camp matters. Women gather plants, women hunt, women fish. Even children must help in the everyday sustenance just to survive, just to acquire the food that's needed for them and their family. This equal status of sexes is also seen elsewhere in hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Hunter-gatherers are mostly monogamous. There is no chieftain with the many wives. That's just another cliché that has been incorporated uh, in, in our everyday use. Instead, the interesting thing about hierarchies, about the rule within hunter-gatherer camp camps, the interesting thing is there is none. Hierarchy in hunter-gatherers is almost unimaginable. There are, of course, occasions when some individual tries to say, OK, I know best for what's... Uh, for I know what's best for you. You must follow my orders. The way hunter-gatherers deal with individuals like this is through mocking them, making jokes about them, not communicating with them and ignoring them, exiling them from the camp, or if the person is annoying enough, murder. So we do not see strict hierarchies amongst hunter-gatherers. We see equality, and the same equality applies for resources as well. In resource, uh, in resource division, the behavior that I admire the most is demand sharing. Whenever a hunter brings back a larger amount of game, a larger amount of meat to the, uh, to the camp, the meat is not shared, is not divided by the hunter. Every person comes and takes what's, what they think belongs to them. Sometimes the hunter and the hunter's family, family are left with significantly less than others have taken. And yet still, the hunters carry on. They go and hunt and bring back food to be shared amongst all of the camp, posing a riddle for game theory and for biological anthropologists like myself. So, 
Hearing some of these very, very brief facts about hunter-gatherers, what can we learn from them? Should we abandon our lifestyle? Should we go live in a jungle or on a beach or in a savanna? Should, should we assume that there's something hardwired in our genes for egalitarianism? No. The lesson we learn from hunter-gatherers is not a lesson of fact. We are not hunter-gatherers. We store, we invest, we save for the future, we, prefer, we prepare for winter. It is not a lesson of fact. Neither is it a lesson of value. There is nothing intrinsically better with hunter -gatherers, uh, in hunter-gatherers than there is in us. We have healthcare, we have art, we have science. All of these things are worth fighting for. But the lesson we learn from hunter-gatherers is a lesson of possibility. Humanity isn't like hunter-gatherers, but humanity can be like hunter-gatherers. There is nothing in our brain or in our genes that makes us follow a strict hierarchy, that makes us sexist, that makes us uh, non-egalitarian. Hunter-gatherers show us the things that Hobbes and Rousseau didn't know about humanity, because all they could see is the world around them and the agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural society surrounding them. If we can see the broad picture of humanity, we see what is available to us. So the next time you go vote in an election and you hear some promises, and you, and you, or you decide a policy yourself, so the next time you must answer the question, what are people like to yourself? Keep this in mind. If we know our limitations, if we question the things that we thought were absolute facts, although we will never be able to know for sure what are humans like, we will be able to make our guess a better one. Thank you.